Hello, uh, my name is Masoud Olia, and I'm a faculty in the Mechanical Engineering Department in College of Engineering and Computer Science. And uh, I'm here with another short video, this time related to uh, the vibrations of mechanical systems. Uh, so uh, I have two systems here, and I thought it's, it's uh, you know, some people have difficulty with understanding the dif difference between the two systems. So I have here a typical mechanical system, which consists of a mass, a spring, and a damper. And we have a, what we call a viscous damper, a dash pod. And then if we remove the dash pod and replace it by friction between the mass and the surface. So here I have what we call the dry friction. So the viscous damping is replaced by dry friction, and this mu k is the coefficient of kinetic friction. What I've shown you here, actually, the way these systems respond. So of course, I have to tell you something about this system. Uh, this system, uh, let me actually start with the differential equation of this system. So a typical system, uh, the differential equation would be mx double dot, that's the um, mass times acceleration, plus cx dot plus kx equals zero. So this is a homogeneous differential equation. If you normalize this, in other words, if you divide it by mass, uh, this eventually becomes a differential equation in this format. So now we have to know about, for example, here omega n, which is the natural frequency, happens to be a square root of k over m. And this zeta is called the damping ratio. It's the ratio of uh, the actual damper divided by what we call a critical damper, which actually becomes c divided by square root of 2km, you could write it also as c divided by 2m omega n. So if you're wondering how we got this, uh, these are basically the manipulation of these terms here. So this is specifically this response that I've shown you here, specifically is for a case which we call an underdamp, where zeta, this damping ratio here, which we defined it, uh, is going to be between 0, 1, 0 and 1. So this is known as an underdamp. So the solution to this system actually is, as you could see, there is a, what we call a decay envelope. So this is known as a decay envelope, this yellow line exponential that you see, decay line or decay envelope. Let me just remove this and call it decay envelope because it's not a straight line actually. And let me give you the, uh, the solution to this. Uh, the way this guy is responding, so remember that this is an underdamped case. So it's going to be an A e to the minus zeta omega nt times sine omega d times t plus some uh, phase angle. So this omega d, by the way, is called the damped frequency and is simply omega n times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. So when you have an underdamped, uh, you have a damped frequency. Uh, so the frequency, the natural frequency of the system, which is the square root of k over m, is altered. All right, so now uh, what I want to show you is that, see the decay envelope is actually this term here. So this is the a e to the minus zeta omega nt right here. And what we have here, this sine wave with this frequency, damped frequency, is actually uh, dying or its amplitude getting smaller and smaller, and it settles down, uh, it settles uh, around some value. It doesn't have to be necessarily zero, it can be any value, depending on how this system is uh, you know, disturbed. By the way, the, uh, these constants A and phi are determined by the initial conditions. So I, my, my goal is not actually show you the, uh, how A and phi are determined. I just wanted to show you how this guy, the, a system like this will respond and make a comparison with this system. Now our system over here would be, if you write the differential equation, would be an mx double dot plus kx equal to a negative uh, mu k mg. And that is actually the friction force that will appear in this equation. So if you do some of the forces in the x equal to mass times acceleration, if you normalize this, you again see this natural frequency here 
and then this becomes minus mu k times g. Notice that there is a big difference between the two systems. Here you have a first derivative, right? X dot, you don't have a first derivative here. This system is homogeneous, meaning, meaning the right-hand side is equal to zero. This system is not, is non-homogeneous. Anyways, the solution to this system, because uh, you have to understand that as the uh, mass moves to the left, friction is moving to the right. So when you go through half cycle, friction is moving to the right. When this uh, stops and moves to the other way, friction will switch direction. Therefore, the solution for the first half cycle, so first half cycle, the solution becomes um, as follows. X of t equal to, x as a function of time, is equal to x0. So this is x0. By the way, we are assuming that initially at t equals 0, x is 0, uh, x is equal to x0, rather, sorry, and initial velocity, which is x dot, is equal to 0. So no velocity here. Uh, so you just give it a disturbance of some initial position x0. Anyways, back here, so this becomes mu mg. By the way, anywhere you see the mu, that's mu sub k, which is the uh, uh, coefficient of kinetic uh, friction. So this becomes cosine omega nt. And then there is a term due to uh, the particular solution, mu mg divided by k. But this is true only for the first half cycle. For the second cycle, half cycle, the equation is a little bit different. You notice we get an x0 minus 3 mu mg over k times cosine omega nt plus, uh, in this case, I'm sorry, uh, minus mu mg. So the difference with this, this first half cycle that you get a negative here. Anyways, so what we noticed is actually when we set uh, our when we go through one full cycle here, peak to peak, how much the amplitude changes? So the initial amplitude was the disturbance x0. How much this amplitude will change? This amplitude, as you could see, will change once this becomes 1 after one cycle, cosine of 2 pi, right? And uh, cosine of 360. And then we get x0 minus 3 here, minus 1 becomes minus 4. So after one cycle, the amplitude decreases by how much? By minus 4 mu mg over k. So actually, this guy now is x0 minus 4 mu mg over k. So from x0 to remove or mu mg over k. And I'll show you a quick example in a minute. But let's make some comparison between these two systems. OK, some major difference. You see here you have an exponential envelope. But for a drive friction, you don't see an exponential envelope. You see an envelope that is linear. The other thing is, theoretically, this would never come to 0 or to whatever value settled on at whatever value. But this guy, so the system never stops. It will theoretically will you know, vibrate forever. Mm, and we know of obviously that's not true because we all always have some friction in the system. But theoretically, mathematically, this equation. Uh, this one, though, it will come to rest at some point, at some time. OK? So you see this is where it actually comes to rest, uh, where that line becomes you know, horizontal. And I'll show you, as I said, in one example. So this is a linear change in the amplitude. This is an exponential change in the amplitude. Uh, the other thing is that this system, the natural frequency is not altered, omega n. Here, the natural frequency for this underdamped case, you do have uh, a damped frequency. By the way, peak to peak, so if you take this peak to peak, that's actually one period. That's the damped period. And the damped period can be determined by taking 2 pi and divided by omega sub d, which is actually omega sub n minus uh, times uh, square root of 1 minus zeta squared, as you could see here. OK, um, so now 
what I want to show you is uh, one quick example. Let's say, let's put some numbers here. Uh, so if we say we have a system exactly as you see here in the picture, if k is equal to, let's say, uh, 4,000, or actually let's make it uh, uh, 30,000 newtons per meter, and let's say mass is 10 kilograms, and you give it an initial um, displacement of 100 millimeters, right? And let's say the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.12. So not much friction, actually. So the question is that if you have this system, give it some initial position with zero velocity, right? Velocity is zero, initial position is 100 millimeters with the given properties that we have here. Uh, where does this guy will come to rest? At what position this will come to rest? So find position where the mass comes to rest. And this is a very simple problem. All we have to do is to calculate this for mu mg over k. So if we go and plug into this, 4 over 0.12 times mass of 10 times 9.81 divided by 30,000 here. So this comes out to be in um, meters 0 0.0157 meters, which is 15.7 millimeters. So that means after the first cycle, so you see this is the 100 millimeters. Now after uh, first cycle, uh, you're going to go through a reduction of 15.7. So the question is within that 100 millimeters, how many of this 15.7 we have. So actually, if we take 100 and divide by 15.7, that becomes a 6. And then what's left over from the, uh, the 100? So that's uh, 5.8 millimeters. So in other words, if you take 6 and multiply it by 15.7 and add 5.8 to it, that becomes 100 millimeters. So basically what this says, and this picture doesn't uh, follow that actually, this will go through six cycles, right? Six cycles of reduction of 15.7, and then eventually it will come to rest at what, at what position? At a position of 5.8. So you see, unlike this system that would theoretically never uh, come to rest, this one at some point will come to rest. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and hopefully I'll come up with more examples uh, later on for you. Thanks for watching.